Good morning. So, uh, neuroimaging, we know we use it every day. There have been a lot of advancement in how we can use it today. It helps a lot in diagnosing, especially in the neurological university. Not so much in psychiatry, but it is very helpful in doing out any organic disorder. Okay, I'll start today presenting the basics of neuroimaging. Good morning, everyone. The topic of my presentation today is basics of neuroimaging, and my moderator is Dhanu. So, what is neuroimaging? Neuroimaging provides visual representation as well as the quantitative analysis of the anatomy, blood flow, blood volume, electrical activity, metabolism, oxygen consumption, receptor sites, and many other physiological functions within the CNS. Neuroimaging, often described as Brain scanning can be divided into two broad categories, namely structural and functional neuroimaging. Structural neuroimaging is used, used to visualize and quantify brain structure, and functional neuroimaging is used to measure brain functions, example, neural activity indirectly, often using functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, or positron emission tomography, PET scan, or functional ultrasound. So, there are various types of neuroimaging, for example, computed tomography, single photon emission computed tomography or the SPECT, SPECT scan, positron emission tomography PET scan, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, functional MRI, diffuse optical imaging and tomography, event-related optical signal, magnetoencephalography, cranial ultrasound, functional ultrasound imaging, quantum optically pumped magnetometer and electroencephalogram. So, in this presentation, we will be basically focusing on CT and MRI. So, first of all, we will start with the basics. So, we have anatomical terminology described here. So, first of all, this is the horizontal plane. What is this horizontal plane? Basically, horizontal plane is parallel to the ground and it divides the body into a cranial part and the caudal part. So, in the section of a brain, this is the transverse section. It is also known as ax axial section. Axial films we see as on CT and MRI. Then, this is the frontal plane. Now, the frontal plane, plane it divides the body into belly and back, into posterior and anterior halves. So, this is the coronal plane, which will divide the brain into anterior and posterior halves. Then, we have the sagittal plane. So, the sagittal plane, divide, it, it runs in the midline of the body and it divides the body into right and left halves. It is known as sagittal because it passes through the sagittal suture, which joins the two parietal bones. So, now, this is some, uh, uh, here I am presenting some of the basic terminologies, which we use in various uh, neuro imaging modalities. So, this picture is of the uh, father of physiology, WC, uh, Mr. William, uh, William Conrad Roengen. So, uh, William Conrad Roengen, basically, he discovered x-rays accidentally. So, this image is the accidental uh, x-ray film of his wife's hand, wearing a ring, which was an accidental finding. So, x-rays are known as x-rays because uh, when he, discover, he discovered certain radiations, the nature of those radiations was not known. So, for example, we have chemical X, which uh, the value of X is not known. So, X-rays, basically rays which are of unknown origin. So, that is why they are known as X-rays. So, in the uh, terminology of X-ray, we have something which is black is known as lucent and something which is white, we call it as opaque. So, radio lucent and radio opaque. Now, CT scan. What is CT scan? CT scan works on the principle of X-ray. CT scan is basically a 3D imaging modality of X-ray. It is a 3D X-ray. Now, computed tomography. So, so what tomo means? Uh, uh, tomo means slices. So, that means that we are uh, viewing the body in slices. So, computerized tomography. Now, CT was discovered by Godfrey Hounsfield. So, that is why Hounsfield units are used by his name. Hounsfield units to signify how much a substance is black or it is white. So, Hounsfield units are used. Now, in CT scan, something which is black, we use the term dense. And for white, oh, sorry, some uh, the suffix changes basically. The suffix used in CT is dense. So, black is hypodense and white is hyperdense. Similarly, in MRI, we use the suffix intense. So, hypo-intense for black and hyper-intense for white. 
in ultrasound whereas echoic is used why because it is based on the principle of sound waves or echoes so hypoechoic echoic for black and hyperechoic for white now and echoic means pitch black now ionizing radiation so ionizing radiation basically what it does it whenever it passes through any matter it ionizes it so uh, it causes dna damage and free radical production so ionizing radiation can be divided into rays and particulate matter so in rays we have cosmic rays which have no diagnostic importance right now for us then we have the gamma rays now gamma rays uh, include radiotherapy nuclear medicine for example spec scan single photon emission computer tomography and then we have the x rays which is the basically the workhorse workhorse of the radiology so x in x rays we have skygrams or radiographs then fluoroscopy fluoroscopy is basically a video of x rays a video of running x rays is fluoroscopy and a contrast agent is used in fluoroscopy for example we have the retrograde urethrogram digital subtraction angiography a computerized tomography scan hysterosalpingography and the dexa scan dual x ray energy absorptiometry which is the scan, which is the investigation of choice for osteoporosis in particulate matter we have alpha particles beta particles neutrons and protons and these are used for radiotherapy okay so ultrasound and mri basically they do not use any ionizing radiation ultrasound ultrasound is based on the principle of sound waves and mri basically uses magnetic waves and for example we have fast which we do in emergency which is focused assessment with sonography in trauma it is also based on the principle of ultrasound now similarly in, in non ionizing scans we have mri and ultrasound in ionizing scans which use x rays we have radiographs ct scan fluoroscopy and dexa and in gamma rays we have nuclear medicine scan now this is a slide which is showing that how much radiation exposure is associated with which modality so basically as the um, as the region of the body involved increases the area increases the radiation exposure increases for example in chest x ray uh, the radiation exposure is 0.02 millisieverts then in skull x ray it increases the modality of x ray which basically uses more of x rays the radiation exposure is more and in head it is 2 uh, millisieverts then chest is more 5 abdomen is more 10 millisieverts because the area involved in abdomen is more and then we have pet scan in pet scan it is the highest radiation exposure 10 to 12 millisieverts now ct versus mri now how do we differentiate that which uh, whether so the first principle here is first of all we look at the bone so the bone as we can all see is white on a ct scan bone is always white on a ct scan on an mri bone appears black bone appears hypodense hypo intense on mri now we'll be we'll get confused because in the periphery we are seeing this white so this white is basically the fat the scalp fat the periphery is scalp fat and fat on mri is hyper intense so we'll differentiate a ct from an mri by looking at the bone so the bone is white on ct and the bone is black on mri now this is a non contrast ct scan why because if it would have been a contrast ct scan we would be uh, seeing you know contrast in the blood vessels so why it would have appeared a bit more whiter so this is a non contrast ct scan now let us come to mri these three are uh, sections of the mri basically these three as we can all see are axial sections of the mri now we'll see t1 what is t1 weighted image and what is t2 weighted image and how do we differentiate between these two images so the mnemonic here is ww2 world war 2 so water appears white on t2 okay so we we see water csf appears white on t2 okay so this is t2 image now this is not the only differentiating factor here so the other differentiating factor is basically t1 weighted image t1 it will live, live up to its name so the gray matter will appear to be grayer and the white matter will be less gray so t1 is living up to its name the gray matter is grayer and the white matter is less gray but in t2 we see that this is uh, basically this is inverse the gray matter appears less gray than the white matter so this is how we differentiate between t1 and t2 so now we have another imaging modality which is flare fluid attenuated inverse resonance imaging so now in flare 
first, so uh, first of all, when we look at fair, we'll we'll see that CSF appears uh, black. So we'll think that this is T1. But then we'll see the cortical differentiation. Now you see the in the cortical differentiation, if it would have been T1, but it is not living up to its name. So the outer gray matter is whiter than the inner one. So that means this is a T2 image. So what we have done here is we have suppressed the CSF signal intensity. So the CSF has been suppressed here so that any other edema which is surrounding can be seen easily. So this is the role of flare. For example, in this, we see, in this image, we see that the CSF signal intensity has been suppressed here and we are better able to visualize any cerebral edema. So this is the role of flare. Now we'll come to the radiological anatomy. We'll be looking at various MRI slices of the brain. So first of all, we look at this image. So whether it is a CT or an MRI, this is an MRI because the bone is black. Now, what kind of image it is, whether it is T1 or T2, this is T2 because CSF appears white. So this is a T2 weighted image, axial section at the level of basal ganglia. Now here we'll study about basal. So these here, these are the frontal, frontal horns of the lateral ventricle. And here we have the occipital forms of the lateral ventricle. So, and this slit-like uh, slit -like ventricle in between is the third ventricle. So the frontal horn, the occipital horn of the lateral ventricle, and then the third ventricle. Here in between the lateral ventricles and the third ventricle, we have the foramen of Monroe, which if uh, uh, occluded leads to uh, more uh, obstructive hydrocephalus. So now, just adjacent to the third ventricle, we have thalamus. So here we'll have thalamus. So we have thalamus here. And just adjacent to the frontal horn of the lateral ventricle, we'll have the caudate nucleus here. For example, here we have the caudate nucleus and here we have the thalamus. Now here we have the lentiform nucleus. The yellow one is the globus pallidus and blue one is the uh, putamen. So we have the uh, lateral ventricle, third ventricle, just adjacent to the uh, third ventricle, we have the thalamus, adjacent to the lateral ventricle, we have the caudate nucleus, and then lens like we have the lentiform nucleus. Now, it is not very appreciable in this image, but here we have a white matter clad, which is known as the internal capsule. And here we have the external capsule. So this is the level at the how we define basal ganglia. Now again, uh, let us look at basal ganglia. This is lateral ventricle, third ventricle, thalamus, caudate nucleus, internal capsule, lentiform nucleus, external capsule. Now coming at the second image. Now this is again a MRI. This is again MRI. This is a T2 